Now I'm going to introduce you to a mind-blowing reaction called the aldol addition reaction. It is really, really cool. If I start with an aldehyde and incubate it with base, what can happen is the aldehyde can condense on another molecule of itself and give me this type of product. You'll notice how complex structurally this product is compared to the starting material. Similar product can be made beginning from a ketone. You might look at this and wonder what in the world is going on? Well, here's the mechanism. Let's say I begin with this aldehyde and I treat it with base. Of course, as you know, this base is going to strip the alpha hydrogen and dump the electrons into that alpha carbon giving me this negatively charged species here. When this negatively charged species is stirring in solution, it's going to eventually find another molecule of the starting material aldehyde, which I've drawn identically to the one here to the left, except just flip uh, over this way. The negative charge on this carbon will then come into this carbonyl carbon and push these electrons up onto the oxygen. This then gives this intermediate. Now this is one of those stages where I think everyone proverbially craps themselves. Because when these, the bond from this carbon and, uh, is formed with this carbon, it's sometimes really confusing and difficult to see how that makes this kind of thing. What I want you to note is that this molecule right here ends up forming this piece of this intermediate up right here. You can hopefully see that this molecule down here forms this portion of this intermediate here. If you need to, you can pause that and look at it until it really looks clear to you. Nevertheless, at this stage, the negatively charged oxygen is going to deprotonate the water byproduct that was made in the initial step, regenerating hydroxide, and ultimately arriving at the final aldol product, this product here. Now this product is not drawn in a very pretty way. In order to draw it in a nice, linear, pretty way, what I'm going to do is count the carbons for you, starting at the carbonyl carbon. Carbonyl carbon is carbon 1, and then we continue down the chain. 2, 3, and 4. And you see that this product, if I draw it in a nice, neat, linear skeletal structure, left to right, is indeed this product. Carbon 1 is my aldehyde. Carbon 2 has two R's on it. Carbon 3 has this hydroxyl. And carbon 4 is a CH that has two R's on it. So this is the ultimate aldol product. You'll see that if I begin with an aldehyde and I run an aldol reaction with it, I ultimately end up with a product that is essentially two aldehydes that have been put together. This product always has a hydroxyl group, this OH, coming off of carbon 3, the beta position. Thus, we can say the product of an aldol reaction is a beta hydroxy aldehyde or a beta hydroxy ketone. One thing I should tell you is that mixed aldol reactions can give multiple products. A mixed aldol reaction is an aldol reaction where you start with two aldehydes that look structurally different stirring together in solution. The reason that those can sometimes or will often give multiple products is because if I have two different looking aldehydes, one might condense on the other to give me one product. The other might condense on the first one to give me a different product. And I might have this aldehyde condensing with molecules of itself to give a different product, and this other aldehyde condensing with other molecules of itself to give a different product. Thus, mixed aldol reactions are not a very efficient way of generating uh, one product a as a major product. The hydroxyl group in aldol products can be removed through an elimination reaction. We see this hydroxyl coming off here. If I want to get rid of that, I can do so by taking this beta hydroxy aldehyde, which is an aldol product, and heating it in aqueous acid. That removes the OH and places a double bond in its place. You might remember that any time we remove an OH through an elimination reaction, we can call that a dehydration reaction. Here's another example. If I begin with this ketone and run an aldol reaction with it, I end up with this beta hydroxy ketone product. Once again, I can stir that with aqueous acid or base, do an elimination reaction, which is really a dehydration, and get this alpha beta unsaturated ketone product.
Here is the mechanism. I start with my aldehyde, or ketone as the case may be. Run an aldol reaction by treating it with base to give my aldol product, a beta hydroxy aldehyde. If I then heat that with acid, what occurs is the net lone pairs on the oxygen reach out, grab a proton. That will convert this OH into water. Very good leaving group. Another molecule of water and that acid comes and grabs this hydrogen, dumps these electrons down like a closing door, and kicks off my water leaving group. That gives me this alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde product. For my final trick, I will now make all of my students disappear by finishing our second video presentation. This will be done by introducing you to our final reactions of the hour, the Dykeman and Diketone condensations. The Dykeman condensation, if I, what I have essentially got is two esters being tethered together by an alkyl chain. In other words, this is a molecule that has two esters in it. If I incubate that with base, I'm choosing methoxide here, I can strip an alpha proton off of this position to get a negative charge at this carbon. When that negative charge comes into this carbonyl carbon, it forms a bond between those two carbons. You'll notice that that forms a nice five-membered ring. These electrons get thrust up onto the oxygen, giving me an O minus. The O minus comes back down and kicks off this methoxy leaving group, ultimately arriving at this type of product. This reaction is similar, except instead of beginning with a diester, I'm beginning with a diketone. In this example, I have a 1,4 diketone. If I treat that with base, the base can strip a hydrogen off of this alpha carbon or off of the internal alpha carbon. Just to make sure you guys recognize this, the alpha carbon here and here would be exactly the same as the alpha carbons here and here because the molecule is completely symmetrical structurally. In the first scenario, if my base strips off an alpha hydrogen here, it gives me a negative charge at the right terminal end. This negative charge could then wrap around and form a bond with that carbon. So I formed a bond between this terminal carbon and this carbonyl carbon pushing the electrons up onto the oxygen. That gives me a one, two, three, four, five membered ring with this O minus up here. That O minus is then protonated in an acid quench workup. I then get this final product. Now you guys might be saying, now wait a minute Mike, couldn't I strip off the alpha hydrogen in here, the internal alpha hydrogen? The answer is in theory, yes. Here's what would happen. If I stripped off the alpha carbon or the alpha hydrogen inside, I would get a minus charge on this carbon. If that minus charge wrapped around and went into this carbonyl carbon, it would form a one, two, three membered ring, which would look like this. Upon protonating that O minus, you'd get this kind of product. So here's the question I have to ask you guys. What ring size is more stable? A three membered ring or a five membered ring? You might remember from last semester that generally speaking, five and six membered rings are the best and most stable ring size. The other rings uh, receive too much angle strain. For, for that reason, this lower pathway is not going to occur because the three membered ring is too unstable. That is denoted or indicated by this little X over this arrow. Hence, if you take this 1,4 diketone and run a diketone condensation, you will get this product up here in the upper right corner as your sole product. Condensations can also be done with diketones of other lengths as well. Here's an example, my 1,6 diketone. If I form a bond between the rightmost carbon and this carbonyl carbon here, it gives me a seven-membered ring. Protonate that, I could get this theoretical product. In this case, if I strip the alpha proton internally, and had it form a bond here, that would form a five-membered ring. Now let's stop and ask ourselves, which ring size is more stable, a five-membered ring or a seven-membered ring? In this case, the five-membered ring is much more stable and favorable than a seven-membered ring. Thus, the internal hydrogen will be the hydrogen that gets deprotonated favorably, ultimately arriving at this product. In this example, I have a 1,5 diketone. I can strip the rightmost proton, and condense here to get a six-membered ring. If I stripped the internal proton, it would give me a four-membered ring. So you guessed it, the six-membered ring is the one that's formed. 
by comparison, if I have a 1,7 diketone and I strip the proton over here at the rightmost side, I would get a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 membered ring being formed. By comparison, if I strip the proton internally and form a ring, it will form a 6 membered ring. Which ring is formed? You guessed it the six membered ring, and that is our major product. This, it seems, is a good place for us to conclude this video lecture. Please come back after you've rested and taken a break and watch our final lecture for chapter 19.